has been made part of the record. The subcommittee asks that you limit your oral remarks to five minutes with that. Mr. Dooms, you are recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Good morning, Chairman Perry, Ranking Member Titus, Ranking Member Larson, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Elliot Dooms, and I am the Commissioner of the Public Building Service at the U.S. General Services Administration. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on how PBS supports the Federal Bureau of Investigation's real estate needs and strategy. Mr. Dooms, can you pull the mic kind of like straight at you there? Yeah, thank you, sir. GSA's intent is to deliver the highest quality facilities for the FBI while maintaining our agency goals of optimizing the federal footprint. GSA partners with federal agencies like the FBI and community stakeholders to meet our mission of providing real estate solutions for the federal government at the best value to the taxpayer. We accomplish this mission by implementing a real estate portfolio strategy to prioritize investments that make optimal use of federally owned facilities disposing of unneeded facilities, and implementing strategies that reduce costs. GSA drives our strategy forward in partnership with agencies like the FBI to support their long-term mission. For the FBI, our priorities are the construction of their new headquarters and the support to acquire and administer their field office operations. PBS is fully committed to providing high-quality space for the American taxpayer GSA's fiscal year 2025 budget request includes $1.6 billion for repair and alterations, of which $584 million is for major repairs and alterations, and a new request for a $425 million optimization program that will allow GSA to reconfigure and renovate federal buildings to better utilize space and to expedite the disposition of unneeded federal facilities. With full access to the Federal Buildings Fund, PBS will be able to reconfigure and renovate core assets under GSA's controls in efforts to right-size our federal footprint faster while saving taxpayer dollars and supporting local economies. GSA leverages its expertise and best practices to support the real estate mission requirements of the FBI. I will provide two examples that illustrate how GSA has worked with the FBI to shrink its footprint and better utilize existing federally owned facilities. First. In October 2020, the FBI was able to eliminate two leases and reduce the total space needs by over 50,000 rentable square feet in New York City by consolidating into the Javits Federal Building. This consolidation resulted in lease cost savings totaling $13 million annually. Second, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, GSA renovated space in the William J. Green Jr. Federal Building to restack the building and enhanced security features, which in turn allowed FBI to consolidate two existing leases into that space. This consolidation eliminated the need for 31,000 rentable square feet with an annual reduction of $840,000 in rent. In accordance with the Consolidated Appropriations Act of fiscal year 2022, last month GSA submitted a report on the construction of a new suburban headquarters for the FBI in the National Capital Region. The FBI headquarters suburban campus will bring together employees from the Hoover Building in eight lease locations across the national capital region for a new modern and secure facility tailored to fully support the FBI's national security, intelligence, and law enforcement mission. The report included a summary of the material provisions of the construction and consolidation of the FBI and a new headquarters facility, including all estimated costs associated with site acquisition, design, construction, management and inspection, and a description of the buildings and infrastructure needed to complete the project. Now that the relevant committees in both the House and the Senate have received the headquarters report required by Congress, GSA awaits the necessary approvals before acquiring the Greenbelt Maryland site and commencing with design and construction activities. The FBI's space needs are not limited to the National Capital Region. Multiple locations throughout the country are experiencing significant challenges. Because the space requirements of the FBI require significant tenant improvements, GSA works closely with the agency to ensure efficient use of space and cost effectiveness for taxpayers. Currently, the FBI occupies 56 field offices across the country, 47 of which are leased by GSA, totaling approximately 12.5 million rentable square feet. The remaining nine FBI field offices are located in GSA federally owned facilities under GSA's control. At these locations, the FBI pays rent that is deposited into the Federal Buildings Fund with the expectation that the, the rent will be used to adequately maintain the facilities that the FBI occupies. 
Providing GSA with full access to the FBF is crucial to our mission of providing the highest level of support to not only the FBI, but to other federal agencies. In conclusion, GSA's mission is to provide the best value in real estate, which means working with the agencies like the FBI to deliver the functional and secure federal facilities that they need in order to fulfill their missions. GSA looks forward to continuing to work with the FBI and this committee on these important projects, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Dooms. Mr. Demos, you are now recognized for five minutes for your testimony, sir. Chairman Perry, Ranking Member Titus, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me today to discuss the FBI's real estate strategy. The FBI's mission is to protect the American people and uphold the United States Constitution. We do this work from our 56 field offices located in metropolitan areas across the United States and in approximately 350 smaller regional sites across the country. From these roughly 400 locations, we cover over 3.8 million square miles of United States territory, where we gather intelligence on terrorists seeking to harm Americans, where foreign intelligence actors seek to erode our economic and military capabilities, where our companies are being hacked, where fentanyl is being trafficked, and where gangs are threatening our communities. Our mission directly impacts the type of space we need. Standard office space does not meet the needs of our special agents, intelligence analysts, scientists, and other professionals. The FBI requires command centers, interview rooms, space for seized drug evidence, weapons vaults, computer forensics laboratories, automotive bays for SWAT vehicles, and space to house equipment for the FBI's chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosives response mission. In addition to FBI employees, our national security and traditional law enforcement programs are supported by more than 7,000 task force officers, many of whom are co-located in FBI space for case coordination and intelligence sharing. These officers support us through cyber, violent crime, gang, and joint terrorism task forces. Our communities are safer, our country is safer, because we are sitting side by side with these partners. Security also drives FBI space requirements. Hostile actors seek to cause harm to FBI personnel and facilities and exfiltrate sensitive information. As we saw just last week when a hostile actor rammed into the gate at the FBI's Atlanta field office, security requirements like vehicle barriers provide critical protection to our working men and women and to our sensitive intelligence. While these mission, partnership, and security requirements incur additional facilities costs, the FBI team and I are committed to being responsible stewards of taxpayer dollars. As part of this commitment over the past several years, the FBI has reassessed the geographic distribution of key functions, relocating programs and teams from the National Capital Region to West Virginia, Idaho, Alabama, and other locations across the country. As a result, over the past five years, the FBI has consolidated 10 leases in the National Capital Region alone, totaling almost $24 million in annual rent savings. In recent years, we've also reduced our office space workspace, workstation size and consolidated closed investigative files at our central records complex in Winchester, Virginia. We are similarly transitioning evidence storage from costly lease space across the country to a facility in Georgia. We have relocated many assets outside of the National Capital Region, and yet certain functions must remain in the DC area, which is why the new headquarters project is critically important to us. Investing hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions, to sustain the J. Edgar Hoover Building is not the best use of taxpayer dollars, hence our request for a new facility and why the FBI and GSA continue to partner closely on next steps for the project. The risk of doing nothing to protect our people and sensitive information is too great. With continued pipe bursts, concrete instability, and failing heating and cooling equipment at JEH. As we work together on the new headquarters project and other important facilities needs across the country, you have the FBI's and my commitment 
to ensure we are doing right by the taxpayer each step of the way. Thank you for inviting me to appear before you today, and I'm happy to answer your questions. We thank you both for your testimony. We will now turn to question. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes for a question. I'm going to start with Mr. Demos. As you know, Congress is expected to consider reauthorization, reauthorization of Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Can you tell members of the committee at which FBI facilities the ones you've enumerated, including headquarters, the satellite facilities, the numerous places around the country. Does the Bureau receive, store, and sift through the commercially provided data on Americans, or is it done across multiple locations and offices? Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. I am not an investigator of the FBI. I'm a facilities and, and, and finance guy. Um, you work for the FBI, right? You know what their mission is. You know what they do. You're, you're, you're testifying before this committee where we consider the leases and the space that the FBI gets. So I would think you would know the mission so you could impart it to these members of this committee so we can make the appropriate decisions. I'm just asking, where does that occur? If, if you don't know, then we will ask you to find out. But we need to know where that occurs. So, sir, well, I can't get into the specifics of talking about as a, uh, as I'm just asking about techniques. the third-party data that the FBI buys where they would otherwise need a warrant. Where do, they, where do they use that information? Where do they call through that information? Is it done at multiple facilities? Is it one facility? Is it a couple facilities? What are we looking at? I'd have to follow up with you, sir, on the specific facilities where that, uh, that type of work would be conducted. Okay. Then I'm going to ask... I'm going to ask that you do that. I'm going to need to know that answer. So that's going to be a formal request. Regarding what's known as the integrated program management, I would call it a quota system. I'm sure that you folks don't like that terminology, but it's apparent to me that that's what's used and it's planned out at the beginning of the fiscal year to, to ensure that these field offices and the different venues, for metrics sake, if nothing else, um, they, they work towards those goals. Can you tell me, is that done across the panoply, the entire purview of the FBI's lease portfolio? Is that, is that done at each one of the offices, or are there certain places where that integrated program management quota system is not used? Congressman, just to make sure I understand the question, you're asking how integrated program management affects our leasing strategy? Yeah, is it used at every single one of the locations, that quota system? We need to, the point is, is that if, if you're doing, if you're using that quota system to provide results that are metrics and you're asking the American taxpayer to fund all these different locations based on that, that would drive our decision. It certainly would drive my decision on the value mm -hmm. of the lease space and how much you actually need. Sure. And it includes, when I talk about integrated program management, it would also include the bonuses that are, are received by FBI officials for reaching or attaining that quota. And if that's occurring at all these different locations, that would drive at least my decision too. Uh, so I'm interested to know if that, if that, integrated program management quota system is, is um, instituted at every single location, including headquarters. My understanding, sir, and, and I can take this back to confirm, but IPM is really focused on uh, field office uh, metrics and evaluating field office performance with a whole lot of feedback and, and uh, analysis and support by headquarters components. And I would say stepping back from IPM specifically each year, uh, the FBI is evaluating the threats in each of the specific field offices, evaluating staffing levels at those field offices to ensure that we are appropriately staffed and we're working the threats as we should. Okay, so and I don't want to put words in your mouth, Mr. Demo, sir, but I, I want to, so if I'm going to characterize what I'm hearing, I want to brief you back, is that IPM, what I would consider a quota system for law enforcement, it used, it is used at every one of the offices other than headquarters. Is that, is that your, is that essentially what you're telling me? I am not an expert in IPM, sir. 
So I would need to follow up with my colleagues. Okay, then that's, a, then that's going to be another a specific request for your office to return the information to, to us, this committee. Can you explain why the FBI, FBI is still proposing authorization for 2.1 million square feet and how, how, with less individuals, what, what, what are we missing there? No, I appreciate that question, sir. So there is still a significant amount of planning still required uh, by the FBI as we put together our more detailed program of requirements. The, the report that was submitted a couple weeks ago uh, references up to 2.1 million square feet, but I will tell you there is still a whole lot of additional uh, work that I need to be doing on my end within the FBI before I can give you a, and the committee, kind of a final answer on what we think our square footage requirement is. Okay, so what I'm hearing is you're saying it's a work in progress and yes, that number actually might be adjusted down, but we'll be interested in that information. I see I've gone over my time, so I'll yield to the gentlelady from Nevada, the ranking member, Ms. Titus. Okay, Ms. Titus yields to Mr. Larson. <clears throat> well, thank you. I, I prefer that she didn't yield to me because I don't want to take her time. So hope, hopefully you mean that she has her own five minutes. Got it. You're, you're taking her place in the order. That's how Got I it. see okay, that as long good. as you're okay with that. Yeah, I'm fine, fine okay. with that. Fair enough. Thanks. Uh, stickler for rules. Um, uh, Mr. Demos, your testimony didn't necessarily come across as a glowing endorsement of the selection process um, it, um, as we've discussed it in the past. And so when you appeared before the subcommittee in December, you expressed concerns, the FBI's concerns with the selection process for the new headquarters. And last week, GSA submitted a report proposing the site acquisition pursuant to the FY22 uh, Consolidation Act. So where, where does the FBI sit in terms now of it, uh, with its uh, satisfaction with the process that resulted in the selection of the Greenbelt site? Thank you for the question, Congressman. Our process concerns remain. They have not changed. And so we uh, continue to await the findings of GSA's OIG uh, so that we can see their complete review and analysis of the process concerns that we've, uh, that, that we've put forward. But of course, we know, separate from those process concerns, that the J. Edgar Hoover building is still failing and we need a long-term solution uh, for a headquarters uh, facility. Yeah. And so we continue to work with, with GSA from a construction planning uh, perspective. Okay, great. And the, and the title is hearing from headquarters building the field offices examining the real estate needs and strategy. Um, we haven't asked anyone to investigate this. Uh, obviously, we're asking some questions about the use of field offices and uh, whether or not the footprint in field offices is both enough or too much is it the right kind of footprint? Um, how would you assess GSA's analysis of your field office footprint and the, and the uses that are necessary for these field offices? Sure, no, thank you for that question. We continue to evaluate our field office portfolio. And going back to my beginning remarks, we continue to evaluate our field office portfolio because the threat continues to change. And uh, as, as trends across the country uh, adjust, we must similarly be evaluating our staffing model as technology adjusts over time. That impacts some of the specific space build out and power uh, build out in our facilities as more and more of our investigative work involves high tech type capabilities. The, from a threat environment perspective, we're also continuing to evaluate how the threat impacts uh, security risks to our people, to our facilities, to our information, and so we continue to evaluate the threat environment and how that might impact changes we need to make to our security posture. And I would say, beyond just reflecting on this, we have very real world examples of how we have adjusted our field office posture over the last several years. Over the last uh, 12 years, we've closed 24 of our resident agencies while opening four. Uh, we've obviously put forward our, our plan to consolidate the Knoxville and Memphis field offices into Nashville, which is a significant uh, level of kind of reevaluation and reimagination of our support to the state of Tennessee. So we are continue to evaluate 
improvements and adjustments to our field space plan. Um, Mr. Dooms, in a typical procurement, GSA provides the shell of the building and the agency pays for the build out. Given their FBI's security needs, I imagine the FBI's build out cost can be relatively high. Um, do you all calculate those upfront, uh, the upfront cost of, of build out, um, and does that then discourage agencies from moving when leases expire? So too much, I don't know, captured capital, if you will. Thank you for that question, Congressman. Uh, that is certainly a part of our consideration. Uh, these high TI costs uh, do impact, but GSA provides the basic shell, and we try to find a competitive rental rate within the district and target that rate, and then the FBI brings money to, table, money to the table to build out some of those specialized uh, uses that they have that you outlined earlier, and we work uh, together, and sometimes we're able to hit the mark Sometimes uh, leases are the most cost-effective way. Uh, we like to do construction uh, because oftentimes owning a building is more cost-effective than leasing, but because we have limited resources and we don't have full access to the Federal Buildings Fund, unfortunately, sometimes we are forced to uh, move to lease leases instead of federally owned construction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair, thanks. The gentleman, the chair now recognizes a gentleman from Wisconsin, uh, Representative Van Orden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dooms, do you know who Nina Albert is? Nina Albert? You do. Can you turn your microphone off, please? So, I'm sorry. Yes, okay. And she's the former building commissioner for GSA. She is the former public building service commissioner. Correct. And what is she doing now? I believe she is the Deputy Mayor of Economic Development for the District of Columbia. Right, so she's in charge of public buildings for the District of Columbia. So she left the GSA because she was an abject failure in her position. That's just a fact. And so now she has moved on to run the public buildings for the city of Washington, D.C. So could you see, potentially, that this would maybe not give us the greatest amount of confidence in the GSA's ability to plan for certain activities such as reimagining the entire footprint for the FBI. That's a rhetorical question. Mr. Demos, um, what is the occupancy rate of the J. Edgar Hoover building right now at, uh, I don't know what time it is here, 10.37 on Wednesday, April 10th? Uh, on average, I think we're, we're referring at over 4,000 seats filled at this point in the J. Edgar Hoover building, sir. How many seats are available? Uh, around 6,000. So how, how many are filled right now? Around 4,000, sir. A little okay. over 4,000. All right, so I was going to list it, guys. I'm just going to do that math in my head. It's about two-thirds occupancy. Is that right? Yes, sir. So there's certain portions of the facility, particularly the lower levels, where we've needed to remove people from the space, given okay. some of the infrastructure challenges that we've had in the building. Yep. There's also continuing to be significant infrastructure challenges uh, that limit how much high-tech capabilities can be in the facility. I get it. Um, okay, so you said the FBI's mission is to, through operational spaces, conduct joint operations, federal, state, and local stuff. You're doing joint counterterrorism, cyber, protecting the seats of the streets. You support unique missions, including uh, custodial spaces for suspects, interviews of victims, evidence of holding, processing weapons, ammunition, computer forensic laboratories, automotive and stuff. So it, it takes a lot of space, right? It does, sir. Okay. Can you tell me how much space it takes to have FBI agents surveilling parents at school board meetings and uh, deeming members of the Catholic Church as domestic terrorists? How many office spaces did that take? Congressman, I appreciate your question. That is, uh, I'm the I can't speak to, the, to that question, sir. You can't. So what's your pay grade? I mean, it's public information. Uh, I'm a member of the senior executive service, sir. Okay, so you're an SCS dude in charge of the buildings for the FBI, and you can't tell me how many of your, of your office spaces are used to conduct surveillance on American citizens and parents at school board meetings asking very specific questions about their treatment of their children and or declaring the Catholic Church and members of the Catholic Church domestic terrorists. The reason I ask this question for you is that I don't really think that you guys have taken the time to do a detailed in, 
uh, in-depth uh, study of what you're actually doing, uh, your members. And so if I take that to be true, which it is, then I don't think you can sit here and tell us how much space you actually need. Because unfortunately, your agency has gotten so far off mission from when it was established, your building's named after J. Edgar Hoover, gotten so far off a task that I don't believe that you are capable of honestly telling us the mission needs of the FBI at this point. So in combination with the GSA's inability to actually plan for a building and your inability to articulate exactly what the mission is of the FBI, other than these flowery, neat words, I don't have any confidence that we're gonna judiciously expend American taxpayers' dollars. And let me be straight with you. One of my best friends in the world is a former FBI agent who I deployed within combat to Afghanistan, and I would do anything for that man. I protected his life specifically. And so I have great reverence for the former institution of the FBI. But I, along with the majority of my constituents and so many American citizens have lost faith in your institution. And for you two to sit here and ask for billions and billions and billions of dollars um, without being able to articulate why you need it is uh, just another symptom of a broken institution. With that, I yield back. Chair, thanks the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentlelady from Nevada, Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Demos, let me be sure I understand. When you say it's two-thirds occupied, doesn't that include some people who have field assignments come in occasionally, kind of like here in the House? People are working, they're in and out of committees, in and out of their office. It's not something that you can count like it's two-thirds occupied. It, it is a constantly fluctuating number, ma'am. Yeah. I mean, as, as you said, I mean, there are uh, uh, operations going on every day that is causing people to surge into the facility, causing people to uh, leave the facility on a given day. Um, you know, of, of course, there are large portions of the facility that are not dedicated just to workspaces in terms of desks and seats, but also to operational space, command centers uh, that we use in the course of day-to-day -day management of the FBI. Storage, that sort of thing. Yeah, I just wanna make that clear for the record. Uh, Mr. Dooms, according to the uh, report, the site selection report that the GSA just submitted, $845 million in construction funding has already been appropriated, and $3.5 billion, though, for this new headquarters, or uh, it was going to be transferred from the proposed Federal Capital Revolving Fund. Now, that fund doesn't exist. And it hasn't, several presidents have tried to get this on and they haven't been able to. So you have some secret that this is gonna be constituted or do you have some alternate plan for if it doesn't happen? Thank you for that question, uh, Congresswoman. Our approach right now is we are requesting the creation of the Federal Capital Revolving Fund along with $10 billion worth of seed money. Uh, we've also been requesting uh, money through the normal appropriations process, but we continue to believe that that is the best way to fund the FBI headquarters. Uh, but we remain committed to working with this committee, as well as other committees, about any other solutions that are on the table. But right now, that is the administration's plan. Uh, if that new building is built out in Maryland or Northern Virginia, what happens to the old Hoover building? Congresswoman, we would, just like any other property in our portfolio, we would examine what the possibilities are. There is the potential that we might retain the site, dispose of the site. We have a national portfolio plan where we scour our inventory and we evaluate each and every asset. And we decide, we've, we've been making decisions about what our core assets are that we'd like to reinvest in. And assets that are not our core assets, we are looking at the possibility of disposing them. Uh, as this plan with the FBI becomes a little bit firmer, we will evaluate the Hoover building in the same fashion. Well, the new headquarters won't be called Hoover, will it? Uh, Congresswoman, it has been the practice of GSA uh, that we do not name buildings. We await on direction from Congress. I heard my colleague talk about how much you respected the old FBI, but not the new FBI, and I guess that means J. Edgar Hoover with all his issues. Uh, anyway, 
I'd like to go back to Mr. Demas. I want to ask you about your position on utilizing public-private uh, partnerships to acquire space. Is that something that's actively pursued? And if it is, how do you get the security for those buildings if you don't control the construction or the management of the building? You were talking about needing fencing or certain high-tech accommodations and just the security in and out the door. How, do you, how does that work? Mm -hmm. I mean, specifically on your question, Congresswoman, about how does the FBI view public-private partnerships as a means of funding uh, space projects, we ultimately uh, rely on funding strategies uh, in coordination with, with GSA and the Office of Management and Budget, so I'd, I'd probably defer to Mr. Doom specifically on, on that point. But as a general matter, how do we handle security in, in leased facilities, non-federally owned facilities, uh, we, we have a layered approach to security in, in the FBI as part of our process. We have security professionals who will review the sites, who will uh, put forward recommendations that I on my team will, will implement to ensure, ensure appropriate physical security, technical security, things I probably can't get into too much more in, in, in this mm -hmm. setting. We also have processes to ensure that uh, all individuals entering the space have the appropriate clearance and have been vetted so that no individuals are entering into FBI space without uh, appropriate authorization. Uh, there are also, of course, elements when uh, that, that come up in the requirements gathering process for the PORs for the sites where you know, there's rules on setback uh, and vehicle uh, barriers, visitor screening facilities, those types of things. Uh, that depending on the procurement strategy, the, the, the building owner, the lessors could be incorporating into their building design and construction. And that's part of the rent, or is that on top of it, Mr. Mr. Dooms? Um, it, so we are required uh, for these above standard tenant improvement costs, uh, the FBI is, is generally providing those funds uh, up front. Uh, and, and then from the ma a maintenance perspective, that's worked on on a it's negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis with the lessor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, the gentlelady. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Representative Graves. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for being here. Um, uh, when, when we spoke in November, I, I raised some concerns about the adjustment in criteria that, that was made um, on, your, on your selection process. And, I'll make note, I was shortly thereafter called to a woodshed conversation with Congressman Steny Hoyer. Um, but uh, in, in any case, um, I, I know that, that um, last month GSA submitted a prospectus and, and, uh, to Congress to consolidate the Hoover Building as well as eight other, eight other buildings. And I know that there are a number of people, including our chairman, that, that have strong concerns about, about the criteria and what was, what was actually submitted. Um, I, I asked last time about the number of meetings, and I asked about uh, the consultations that between GSA and the FBI, um, and 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 the conversations they had with representatives of of, of other states. Have, have have you all provided any information to the committee about some of the meetings and consultations that you've had, and the content of the meetings with the uh, with the states on on this site selection process and and relocation? Thank you for that question, Congressman. Uh, I believe we have provided this committee with some of that information. We continue, we provided over 6,100 documents and we have continued to provide them on a rolling basis. Uh, but I believe we have provided you with consultation deliberations um, as well as uh... uh, Mr. Dooms, let me, let me ask this and I, and I obviously that's a, that's a tremendous amount of information, but I'm not clear on, on how much information you have, so I don't know if that is 99.9% .9 or I don't know if that's 1%. Can, can you give some clarity in, in regard to how much more information you think is owed to the committee to fulfill the request? I do not believe that we have fulfilled all of the requests that we received in December, uh, but we are committed to cooperating with this committee and continuing to provide you documents on a rolling basis. Okay, um, I, I appreciate that. The, the next question, and I apologize, I had to step out for a minute and I didn't hear the, the full dialogue that you had with uh, Mr. DBO here, but um, in, in regard to, to Nina Albert, um, and, and did you uh, provide clarity on which meetings she was involved in and any, any role that she played in, in this? 
Was, was that answered or information provided to the committee? I believe so, Congressman. We provided in our GSA reading room, this is as a part of making this a transparent site selection process, uh, we've provided the documents related to the amendment to the site selection process that was made, I believe, in July of 2020, 2023, which made it clear that uh, Ms. Albert was going to be serving as the site selection authority. So I believe we have provided that demo those documents. I, I look forward to following up with our, our chair and, and staff to make sure that those requests were fulfilled. Um, I, I think we, we had the understanding that there may be some gaps in information on both of those. Um, next one is, uh, as I understand, I think 50% of the FBI employees actually are Virginia residents, and I think uh, the other 50% are some combination of D.C., Maryland, and, and, and a few other states. Um, have you all done a traffic analysis looking at the impact of uh, the, the, uh, the Greenbelt site and what would end up happening with, with traffic patterns as a result, traffic impacts? Congressman, I don't believe we did a study of the traffic patterns, but uh, transit was one of the factors and criteria that was considered uh, when we were selecting the site. Uh, I believe that particular area of transportation access was 20% of the site selection criteria. And I would point you to, it was a discussion of that in the site selection decision where we discussed what the impacts were to traffic and getting FBI employees to and fro from the site. Uh, last question I have, in, in, the, in the 117th Congress, we passed bipartisan legislation that allowed for the GSA to uh, negotiate uh, below market lease rates. Uh, have, have you all received implementation guidance from OMB? Has that actually, has that law been implemented? Uh, Congressman, we continue to work with the Office of Management and Budget on the legislation that was passed. At the direction of this committee, GSA has been consistently trying to negotiate uh, purchase options within our lease contracts, but there's still some disagreement as we continue to work with OMB about uh, bargain purchase options. And, and so I'm not missing anything in that the delay in, in implementing this is actually costing taxpayers more money potentially because you're, you're currently not allowed to go and negotiate below market rates at this point? We continue to work with OMB and with this committee uh, on that matter, but right now we do not believe we have the authority to negotiate bargain purchase options. So, so what I said is accurate. At, at this point, it, you don't have the ability to save additional taxpayer funds, even though the law has been enacted. We are committed to working with this committee, but no, we do not believe we we have the authority to negotiate bargain purchase options. Okay. I'll, I'll Chair, interpret that as a yes. Thank you. Yield back. <laughs> I thought so. Chair, thanks, a gentleman. Before turning to Ms. Norton. Uh, Representative Norton here, I just want to inform everybody that because the chair still has some outstanding questions and some of the other members do, we'll do a second round. But with that, chair now turns to Representative Norton for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Jooms, uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, Congress continues to miss your excellent work as a staffer. Uh, at last December's hearing on FBI headquarters, I asked you about the future of the site of the FBI's current headquarters on Pennsylvania Avenue in the District of Columbia. The current site is a prime opportunity for mixed use development, which could help activate Pennsylvania Avenue and draw visitors off the National Mall and into downtown DC, and of course, generate tax revenue for the District of Columbia. You testified that GSA was currently working through a plan for the site. You also said that if GSA determines in its review that the site is surplus property, GSA will dispose of it. What is the status of GSA's review of that site? Uh, thank you for that question, Congresswoman. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have an update we continue to review this site as well as all of the assets within our 362 million square foot uh, portfolio uh, as a part of our national portfolio plan and identifying our core assets and which assets uh, we believe are underutilized or, or surplus to the needs of the government. Uh, we have not come to a determination on the Hoover site at this point. When, when you finish with that review, I hope you will submit it to this committee. Absolutely, Congresswoman. 
uh, with a new headquarters, GSA plans to identify federally owned space to support 750 to 1,000 um, FBI personnel who will remain in the District of Columbia. Where is the F, uh, GSA considering relocating these personnel in D.C., and does this include new construction? Uh, Congresswoman, we continue to scour our portfolio here in the District of Columbia. Uh, I think we plan to continue to work with the FBI uh, as they work through their program of re requirements, and as their uh, program of requirements is finalized, we will look to some of the buildings here in Washington, D.C., perhaps some that are underutilized now, uh, to find out the best candidate, uh, working closely with the FBI on what their security needs are, as well as the, their proximity issues and their need to be close to the uh, main, main justice, the White House, and Congress. Well, that, is, that, is new construction included? Congresswoman, right now all of the options are on the table, but uh, given our portfolio here in the District of Columbia, I think we would probably lean into uh, repair and alterations on an existing building, but we have not come to a final determination and we are waiting until the FBI completes their program of requirements. Uh, I would also like to discuss plans for a new FEMA headquarters. The prospectus for the modernization of the ROD building at 7th and D Street puts the cost of total construction at $177 million. However, the uh, pre-solicitation estimates put the cost of construction at 400, and, uh, t t at 400 to $500 million. Why is there such a gap between the prospectus and pre-solicitation? pre-solicitation estimates. Congresswoman, thank you for the opportunity to clarify on that issue. Uh, when GSA provides a building to another federal agency, GSA is responsible for pro providing a warm lit shell. And uh, much like our relationship with the FBI, the FBI has to bring a certain amount of money to the table to do the tenant improvements. So the prospectus that we submitted to Congress represents GSA's portion of the project with the expectation that DHS is going to bring additional funds to the project, which takes it up from $174 per gross square feet up to somewhere between $400 and $500 per gross square feet for the actual full and complete building. Uh, well, thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair thanks the gentle lady, and now the chair will recognize himself for the second round. Um, Mr. Demos, I want to uh, characterize my request to you this way um, for the previous two questions that I asked that you would respond to. Will you and can you commit to re providing those responses within the next two weeks in accordance with the statements I mentioned when I opened the, these proceedings? I'll work expeditiously to meet that timeline, sir. Two weeks? I'll, I'll do my best, sir. Well, I know you'll do your best, but I need a commitment. So if it's not two weeks, I can accept that. But is it three weeks then? Or what, what, what do you feel comfortable with? Uh, um, we'll, we'll stick with the two weeks, sir. Do my okay, best. Okay, two weeks. weeks. All right, thank you, sir. So, so with that, Mr. Dooms and Mr. Demos, in December, the chairman, Chairman Graves, and I sent the FBI, GSA, and the former Public Buildings Commissioner Nina Albert letters with specific questions and requesting production of certain documents. Interesting, we only, interestingly, we only received former Commissioner Albert's responses by the deadline of the letter. We subsequently received initial responses from the FBI and the GSA that was missing a significant amount of the information requested. Then not surprisingly, after this hearing was confirmed, we received an additional response on Monday, today's Wednesday from the FBI, and yesterday, Tuesday, GSA, but we're still missing key responses to our request. When will the GSA and the FBI complete the document production to the committees? And Mr. Dooms, I know that Chairman Graves asked, asked you essentially the same question. I know you're interested in cooperating, but look, we, 
we, we got to get something accomplished here. You have leases pending. We need to make decisions, but we're not going to make, I will guarantee you, I'm not going to make decisions or ask anybody on this committee to, to make decisions without the complete uh, information. So, so I need to ask you when we will complete the document production, if you know. Congressman, thank you for that question. We plan to commit the document submission as expeditiously as possible. C can you commit to three weeks, two weeks, one month, six years? What can you commit to? Congressman, we, we've been producing them on a rolling basis. We will continue to do so. We want to cooperate. We've been in close contact with your staff, uh, but I cannot, uh, I don't believe I can offer a date certain, but. Can, we'll can, you, can you give me your wildest guess? I mean, you get paid every, pay period, whether you produce anything or not, the American people demand this information through their representatives. We have to make decisions on behalf of the FBI. We can't make the decisions without the information. What can you commit to? A year? Six months? One month? Give me something. As soon as possible, Congressman. Well, as soon as possible, I'm going to characterize that as two weeks. Will you commit to two weeks? Seems like a reasonable amount of time to me. Because as soon as possible to me is like today, but I'm going to give you two weeks. Congressman, we produce them on a rolling basis. We will continue to do so, and as soon as Okay, so you're not going to answer. You're not going to commit, Mr. Demos. You got anything better? This is the FBI, the most, the most storied and, and effective uh, intelligence and law enforcement agency on the planet. Can you commit to anything? Again, sir, we will work as expeditiously as possible. Well, I got to tell you, that's pretty weak in a business that I operated in and that I managed. You wouldn't have a job, but uh, with that... Let me ask one final question. Taxpayers invest a tremendous amount of money in lease field offices that go far beyond the rental payment. There are several examples of evidence rooms, holding cells, armories, classified rooms, physical security infrastructure, and a variety of other things. Most of these investments have a useful life far beyond the 20 years, and so it would seem extremely wasteful and unreasonable to ask task taxpayers to pay for a new build to suit leases every 20 years for an FBI field office. Does that sound reasonable? Would you agree with that? It's, it's unreasonable to ask them to commit to that and then that just, that hard infrastructure goes away? Either one of you guys? Sir, absolutely. That is, there is a significant amount of up, upfront investment for FBI space. And that's why I would say as leases come up for renewal, that is why the vast majority, when we look at the procurement strategy, does not actually result in a relocation. As we look at the last five years, we had 14 commercial leases uh, go up, uh, reach the end of, of life. 12 of those ultimately resulted in staying in place. Well, I, I will tell you, we're gonna be taking a look at that portfolio with that in mind. Some of the pr prospectuses pending before this committee would effectively guarantee that wasteful outcome, and, and we don't want that. So we don't want the highest cost option possible to be justified, uh, and, and so I just want to let you know that moving forward. With that, my time has expired, and I would recognize now the ranking member, Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, over the course of the last couple of Congresses, we've approved several new museums for the mall. There's one for women's history and one for uh, Latin American history, culture, et cetera. Are y'all working on uh, finding a lo locations for these new museums that are supposed to be on the mall? And why wouldn't you look at some of the underutilized buildings, like say the Department of Energy building, uh, and work with the Smithsonian to use some of that space for these museums? Congresswoman, thank you for that question. As you pointed out, the Smithsonian has the lead on identifying locations, and I believe they have identified two locations, uh, but we're partners with the Smithsonian. We meet with them regularly, and um, we're always looking at our portfolio, and if they made a request uh, of us, I can promise you that we will work in a cooperative fashion with the Smithsonian. Well, will you check out where they are on this and let me know if they're moving forward, if they've got, made any substantive progress or if they're just talking about it, whatever. Congresswoman, I will commit to you that I will absolutely uh, meet with the Smithsonian and make sure that uh, they understand that we're willing to be our partner, partner with them.
help them along the way. Thank you. Uh, going back to the investment that you have to make in some of these buildings that you lease that, that is up front and you say it lasts for 20 years, it seems to me if you make an investment up front on something that lasts for 20 years, that's a pretty good deal. Plus, you, a lot of things change in 20 years, technology and stuff. So if you have to redo some things at the end of the 20 years, wouldn't that just be kind of the normal course of things? Thank you Mr. for the Demos? question, Congresswoman. This is why for each lease that comes up for renewal, we work with GSA to reevaluate the requirements that we have for that facility. Again, looking at the threat environment, how staffing has changed, how technology has changed. And then we're working together with GSA on a specific procurement strategy for, for each. Yeah. As you look out there for places to rent, have you noticed any unusual uh, changes in the rental market? based on the economy and post-COVID? I'd need to defer to Mr. Dooms on, Mr. on that Dooms. point. Congresswoman, I, I think you're right. Uh, I think there have been changes, and we are trying to evaluate. We are going into the market, and we are aggressively working with agencies to find the best deals. But to your earlier point, uh, generally owning is cheaper than leasing. And this is why GSA has been pursuing a fix to the Federal Buildings Fund to give us full access to it, because, uh, for example, one of the outstanding uh, FBI leases in Cleveland, uh, we submitted a request to Congress to allow us to purchase the building because we determined that that was the best option for taxpayers, and that request was not met, and which is why we had to pivot and turn to leasing. But I agree with you, and this is why we support a fix to the Federal Buildings Fund, because if we spend the money on capital costs, we will be able to significantly decrease cost to taxpayers. And it's an important thing that we are pursuing here at GSA. It was in our FY24 budget request. It is also in our FY25 budget request. And the kind of projects that we're doing with the FBI, if we had full access to the Federal Buildings Fund, we would be doing construction projects instead of leases. Gotcha. Well, thank you. I'll yield back. Thank you. Chair, thanks to General Lady. The chair now recognizes a gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Representative Ezell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you both for being here today. Uh, last week, the committee received an official report on the proposed FBI headquarters. Uh, this report calls for Congress to appropriate $10 billion to the Federal Capital Revolving Fund, uh, FCRF, even though this, is, this fund does not have congressional authorization, as I understand. Similar requests to create and fund the FCRF have been denied in the past. Mr. Demos, given this history, do you think there's anything different about this request, and do you think it'll be funded? Thank you for the question, Congressman. The requirement for the J. Edgar Hoover building and a replacement for it is, is real. The challenges with the facility only continue to grow, and we need congressional support uh, and, and funding support uh, for the project. Okay. <clears throat> Switching topics a little bit, Mississippi's 4th Congressional District, there are 20 GSA buildings. Of those 20, uh, three buildings are owned by GSA, while the rest are leased. Among the 17 that are leased, uh, the FBI has three satellite offices, all of which are multi-tenant offices. Do you believe this is adequate uh, security uh, at these FBI satellite offices in the multi-tenant buildings? If not, do you have any recommendations to, to improve the protection? Thank you for the question, Congressman. Our satellite offices, our resident agencies have different um, leasing models throughout the country. Several are in multi-tenant buildings. Mm -hmm. That is not unique just to the, the state of Mississippi. Uh, as I said earlier, with each site, whether it's a standalone facility or a multi-tenant facility, we have a a security review that takes place to ensure that it is a, an appropriate level of risk that the FBI is accepting and that we have the appropriate countermeasures in place mm -hmm. in order to address that risk. Very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, expanding on the topic of security, in 2020, the Secure Federal Lease uh, Form Espionage and Suspicious Entanglements Act was signed into law. Uh, this act aims to prevent foreign influences on GSA leased buildings. However, all 17 buildings in my districts entered lease agreements before the enactment of the law. 
Uh, Mr. Dooms, how concerned should I be about the security of these buildings in South Mississippi and especially regional FBI buildings across the country? And what is the GSA doing to ensure FBI buildings are not indirectly controlled by foreign adversaries? Uh, Congressman, thank you for that question. Uh, we are always concerned with security and we continue to work with our partners at the FBI. Uh, in December of this past year, we submitted all, uh, a list of all buildings owned by foreign, with foreign beneficial owners uh, in any new lease actions, but there are also uh, existing leases that we are trying to address, and we are proactively working with the FBI to notify them whenever there is a foreign ownership of a building that they're in so that they can take the proper mitigation steps. Very good. Mr. Demas, do you think leasing FBI satellite offices in this, is this the most efficient use of taxpayer dollars and accomplishes the mission of the FBI? Our resident agencies, those satellite offices are critically important components of the way we do our work. And so uh, I would argue that the return on investment for the American people is exceedingly high. Very good. I worked in one of those offices for three years during my career and, and uh, felt very good every time I was there. And, and uh, you know, let's make sure that we take care of our men and women who are out there uh, enforcing the laws and protecting this country. So thank you. That, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, thanks a gentleman. The chair now recognizes a gentleman from Wisconsin, uh, Representative Van Orden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just have a couple of questions or a statement first. The general lady from Nevada, um, J. Edgar Hoover was responsible for some tremendous civil rights violations and in no way, shape, or form do I support that at all. The FBI miss is the one that didn't uh, conduct over 200,000 illegal instances of surveillance of American citizens, abusing Section 702 of the FISA uh, to conduct uh, unlawful surveillance on the former president, President Trump, who should be the next president coming up here, God willing. I also, I'm talking about the FBI that did not classify uh, parents at school board meetings and Catholics as domestic terrorists. That's, that's the FBI, the new FBI, that I don't appreciate at all. And I also do not appreciate uh, anyone insinuating that I would support anybody that uh, would do anything to violate Americans' civil rights. That is not the case. Um, I just want to clarify with Mr. Dooms, did the former chairwoman, commissioner, Nina Albert, participate in any of these negotiations at all? You said you told us that, and I don't recall hearing it. Congressman, she was the site selection authority that ultimately made the decision that the Green Belt provided the most value to taxpayers. Okay, what I would like from you is a specific itemized list of every meeting that she had anything to do with, even tangentially, because as we discussed, she left in shame for a real good reason. And with that, I yield back the remainder of my time to Chairman Perry. Well, thank you. Uh, I do have one remaining question uh, for Mr. Dooms. It appears that the criteria for the site selection had changed at some point uh, regarding the proximity to Quantico as well as, as equity. And, and Maryland was able to address those changes in weighting of the site selection criteria. But it's my understanding that Virginia was not apprised of that. Is that, can you confirm that? Uh, thank you for the opportunity to clarify, uh, Congresswoman. Congressman. In December of 2022, Congress directed GSA to have consul consultations with both Maryland and Virginia. We had those consultations in March. As a result of those consultations, we made changes to the criteria in July of 2023. That was reflected in the amendment to the original site selection plan. So it was always clear to both delegations. It was, and it was posted in our GSA reading room and pu publicly available. So the criteria change, everyone knew. So it's, it's your testimony and your position that the criteria was changed and both Maryland and Virginia had exactly the same amount of resources, including time and notification, to respond to the change in weighting of the classific classification criteria. That's your? Absolutely, Congressman. All right, I thank you for that. Gentlemen, I yield back the balance of Mr. Van Orden's time, back to him if he needs it. If not, 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do not. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Uh, thank you. The gentleman yields back. Are there any further questions for any members of the subcommittee who have not been recognized? Seeing none, that concludes this hearing for today. I would like to thank each of the witnesses for your testimony, and we know it's not easy sometimes being here, but we appreciate uh, you taking the time and standing for the questions. And with that, this sub subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you, madam.